It has been predicted that by 2050, which is less than 30 years from now, more people will die because of antimicrobial resistant infections than because of cancer. And this is an incredibly sad and depressing statistic, but unfortunately it is becoming a reality. Already in 2019, more than one million people died because of resistance infections that could normally be easily treated with antibiotics. And this problem is only getting worse. And so it's not an exaggeration to say that um, this antimicrobial resistance is becoming one of the biggest problems in healthcare that we are facing today. And it's still not advancing, so. Is there any manual way I can advance the screen? <coughs> All right, we're there. And so if I talk about biggest challenges in healthcare, obviously your mind is going to the COVID-19 pandemic. And just to put it in perspective, it has been estimated by the World Health Organization that around 7 million people died because of COVID over a period of more than three years. And this is very much within the same order of magnitude as the people that we are losing due to antimicrobial resistance. And obviously these numbers are very rough estimates, but it does give you a sense of the severity of the problem. And so we urgently need new antibiotics, and this is where it becomes very problematic because we are not developing these antibiotics. And there's many reasons for this. For example, it has become very difficult to find new antibiotics, but another part of the issue is that antibiotic development is not profitable. So there's very little incentive for companies to start diving into this issue. <laughs> Also here, there are many reasons that you can think of, but one of them is that anti any antibiotic that you develop will eventually become useless or at least less effective because resistance will develop. And so the lifespan of your drug is quite limited. And so obviously this is a problem and we started thinking about ways that we can tackle this issue. More specifically, we wanted to find ways to expand the lifespan of the drug to be able to provide more time to recover the investments made. And we wanted to do this by making predictions a priori about which protein targets might be good to work on to develop antibiotics against. Um, and so we figured that if we find protein targets that are less likely to lead to resistance development, this will uh, create some incentive to look at these and develop antibiotics. And the way that resistance development is usually assayed in the lab is uh, like this. So you start with bacteria, you divide them over different reaction volumes, you add an increasing concentration of the compound to be tested, and you let these bacteria grow. This typically occurs in an overnight incubation step, and then you check with which concentration, the highest concentration of your compound, your bacteria could still grow. You take these bacteria and you subject them to a new experiment where, again, you add increasing concentrations of the compound. And you do this over and over and over and over again in an iterative cycle until you have selected for mutant bacteria that can grow with uh, higher concentrations of the compound. And here you see an example of where we selected for resistance development against the antibiotic cyclofloxacin. As you can see, it took us 15 days, so 15 cycles, to get to just one truly resistant mutant. Um, and I know most of you here are eukaryotic researchers. You think 15 days is okay. I'm a bacteriologist. I am very impatient. 15 days is forever. So we think this is a relatively time-consuming, very low throughput way of selecting resistant mutants. And in the end, we ended up with just one. While we can reasonably reasonably expect that there are, there are many more that we could possibly find if we would uh, extend this experiment even longer. And so this is far from ideal. In an ideal scenario, we would have just one reaction volume that we would subject to, to just one incubation step and then be able to isolate all possible mutations that provide resistance to our compound. And we figured that we could do this by using a saturation mutagenesis library of the antibiotic target. All possible mutations are already present in our initial population and we can draw them out by adding the compound and letting the resistant mutants grow. So this is exactly the approach that we went for. Then we had to choose some targets to work on. So we chose these three E. coli proteins, FOPSET, LPXC, and MIR-A. 
all of them are seen as attractive antibiotic targets and what they do exactly is not very important for my talk but just for your information all of them are involved in the synthesis of different compounds of the gram-negative cell envelope and so are also present in E. coli. And so we made saturation mutagenesis libraries for all of them where we replace every amino acid with every other amino acid and for each position we also included a synonymous mutation to serve as a control. Now very importantly we wanted to introduce these mutations into the genome in their native genetic context because if we don't, uh, and we provide them as an external copy under control of an external expression system, then we have to deal with these differences in expression level, different copy number effects, and these can very easily influence our readout of viability and, um, and resistance. So we wanted to introduce over 17,000 mutations into the genome in the native context, so we went for high throughput CRISPR-Cas genomic editing. So our protocol was based on the CREATE procedure, which is published uh, in this paper. And this protocol makes use of two editing plasmids. One of the plasmids encodes an optimized Cas nuclease, uh, the MOT7, and the other editing plasmid contains a single guide RNA together with a repair template. Obviously, the repair template contains the desired mutation, but also a synonymous spam site mutation that prevents recutting after successful integration of the oligo into the genome. And the way that we practically uh, did this editing is by using a benchtop instrument called the Onyx platform, developed by Inscripta. Now, what we basically did is just feed our bacteria to this machine, together with a pooled library of repair plasmids, and then the machine did everything for us. So it electroporated the plasmids into the cells, it did the editing, and then after an overnight run, we could just collect the pools of mutant uh, uh, bacteria. We were very fortunate to have access to this technology while it was still being development, developed, uh, thanks to our institute's TechWatch team who made the connections for us and provided us with the funding. And so we made the mutants into two, uh, three different pools, each for every enzyme that we were looking at. Um, and then uh, we could do easy uh, quality control of the mutants as they came off the machine. So uh, very important, all of these three enzymes, they are essential for E. coli viability, which means that obviously we do not expect all mutations that we want to introduce to also be present in the library. Non-viable mutations will drop out very easily because they do not support protein function, they do not support viability. Still, we were able to see an edit efficiency of around 15%. This, of course, also means that 85% of our populations were either still wild type or had some kind of uh, wrong mutation present. Uh, but still, our pool was large enough, our sequencing depth was good enough, so we had a nice coverage of the mutants we wanted to make. We also estimated the saturation level. We made this estimation just based on the synonymous mutations there so that we did not have to deal with non-viable mutations and we uh, estimated to be around 96%. Then we added another growth step. Um, we did this to make sure that all non-viable mutations would for sure be uh, absent from our library when we started looking at them. Um, and then we sequenced the libraries uh, by Illumina sequencing. Uh, the libraries are barcoded on the repair uh, plasmid, but since we are just targeting single genes here, we sequence the genes directly. We sequence both as they came off machine and then after the growth step. And then of course the fun can start. We can start playing around with these data. Um, and the first very rudimentary way of looking at these data is what I show you here, where at each position in the protein I show you the number of different amino acids uh, or the amino acid changes that we can find successfully present in the library. Now, uh, I came into this project very naively. I knew nothing about deep mutational scanning and at least to me, it was very surprising to see how many of these positions can actually be occupied by any amino acid. How little these essential proteins actually care about their individual amino acids. And so another way of representing these data is by showing you the cumulative frequency of successful amino acid edits, where we see that over half of all residues can be occupied by all or all but one amino acid, 
highlighting the incredible mutational flexibility of these essential proteins. But I, what I also want to highlight in this graph is that you me immediately see some differences between the three different proteins that we chose. Uh, where MIR-A, the red line here, is clearly less tolerant to mutations than the other two. But we sequenced our populations at different time points, meaning that we can also calculate the fitness effects of all different edits, which is what we did. And of course, I show you uh, one of these variant maps, uh, where here you can see fitness defects in lighter shades of blue. And so white means that an edit is completely absent from the population. And looking at these data, we were actually wondering if we can get some mechanistic uh, information out of it to get to some molecular biology. And so by looking at the wide regions here on this plot, we figured that we can identify important regions for protein function. And indeed we can. You see the rather broad band um, around between 60 and 80, a residue 60 and 80. Um, this is where the substrate binding site of FOPSET is located. And the narrow band uh, right before that uh, is actually corresponds to the catalytic residue. So indeed, we capture biologically relevant information in these uh, variant maps. We, of course, have them for every protein, um, where once again, for LPXC, you can see important regions. But what I also want to highlight here is that, is that you can also see regions that are not important for protein function. The LPXC C terminus is not associated with any fitness defect whatsoever. And indeed, if we go into the literature and look up what we already know about this enzyme, it is indeed known that the C-terminus does not contribute to catalytic activity at all. Instead, the C-terminus is a regulatory sequence, and if there is an excess of LPXC activity in the cell, this regulatory C-terminus is recognized by a protease that then leads to degradation of the enzyme. But in the growth conditions that we chose, LPXC activity is just in the right amount, so this C-terminus is not uh, important. We do expect that if we select the library in other conditions where there's too much LPXC activity going on, that we would see some fitness effects of this C terminus. So highlighting that we can start looking at condition dependent functionalities of these proteins. And just to be uh, thorough, I also show you MER-A. But I think you will agree with me, looking at all of these plots, there's so much information there that it's of often very difficult to find the actual key residues in the protein. And so to try and condense this information a bit more, we uh, also calculated tolerance scores for each of the residues in the proteins, where a higher score means that a residue is more tolerant to different amino acid substitutions. And so if we're looking at mechanistic insights, we want to focus on those residues that have low tolerance score, that cannot be mutated to many different amino acids. But of course, uh, residues with low scores can be important for many different reasons. And one possibility is that they are important for protein folding or stability. And while obviously this is important and very interesting, from a mechanistic perspective, these are not immediately the residues you want to focus on. And so to try and filter these one out, we also looked at the relative solvent accessibility of all of these residues. A relative solvent accessibility is a measure for how exposed a residue is to its environment with residues that are buried deep inside the protein having, having an RSA score of zero or close to zero. And so this way we can really filter and, and you know, um, distinguish these type of residues. And we wanted to focus on those residues that have a low tolerance score, so are important for protein function, but are also exposed on the surface of the protein, so have a higher RSA value. And when we look at these individual residues for all of our proteins, and we put them next to the information that is already available about these proteins, we see that we can recapitulate known information quite well. We identify all catalytic residues that are out there, we identify all substrate binding sites, and on top of that, we provide some additional information, uh, like specific confirmation of loops that are closed but not at uh, the substrate binding site, for example, this is type of information that we can get out of it. Another representation that I wanted to share with you is this overlay of the tolerance score on top of the protein structure, where you can quite immediately see regions that are important for MER-A functionality. 
we see the substrate binding site highlighting highlighted up in red very clearly. And so this is, very, I think, a very nice way to get a sense of the mechanisms that go on and the important regions of your protein. Now, all of the enzymes we selected for saturation mutagenesis are enzymes that work uh, on their own in isolation. But I am convinced that if you would apply this method to other types of proteins, you would also be able to identify allosteric regulation sites or sites of protein-protein interactions, which might be very interesting to dive into further for uh, less characterized proteins. And although all of this information I find very interesting, it does not address my initial problem statement. So uh, let's switch to that. Can we now actually use this information to help guide the development of new antibiotics? And I've shown you this graph before, uh, and I will highlight it again. We found that MUR A is much less tolerant to amino acid substitutions than are other proteins. So based on this information, we actually predict that compounds that target near A would be less likely to lead to resistance development simply because less mutations in near A are allowed. And this is a prediction that we can easily test. So we went back to our libraries and looked for compounds that can block the activity of each of these enzymes. Unfortunately, no inhibitors for FOPSET are known, but for the other two proteins, we have some compounds to work with. Phosphomycin targets MIR A, and this is actually an antibiotic that is known and already uh, clinically available on the market. For LPXC, we chose two lead compounds that um, are the starting point for the development of anti LPXC therapies. And so we grew the libraries in the presence of all of these compounds and then selected, we, we looked at the resistant mutants that were able to grow during this uh, growth step. We tested all of the compounds at several different concentrations, but basically all of the findings hold up for any concentration tested. And you see here that compounds that target LPXC, shown in blue, consistently lead to a higher frequency of resistance than compound that targets MUR A, shown in red. So it is indeed true, our prediction, um, MUR A seems to be a better antibiotic target, at least from the perspective of resistance development. However, an important pitfall in these types of experiments, uh, which I will explain actually makes our conclusion even stronger, is that we cannot be sure at this point if the resistance that we see is due to the mutations present in either LPXC or MUR A. They can also uh, be caused by spontaneous resistance mutants elsewhere in the genome. And to account for this, I did the exact same experiment, but also with a wild type strain, which is shown in gray. Now, for the LPXC targeting compounds, we clearly see that the resistance that we detect is much, much higher. Well, the frequency of resistance we detect is much higher for our LPXC saturation mutagenesis library than for the wild type, which indicates that indeed the resistance mutations are the mutations that are present in LPXC. However, for MUR A, this is completely not the case. The frequency of resistance we see in the wild type culture is the same as MUR A which led us to believe that MIR A mutations here are not causal to resistance. And to check this, we sequenced the MIR A library selected on phosphomycin, and we indeed saw that the vast majority of cells we obtain still have a wild type MIR A gene. And for those cells that we did find uh, mutant MIR A alleles, we established that these MIR A variants are not causal to resistance. So here in this case, we get phosphomycin resistance because of other mutations elsewhere in the genome. But it also means that we were actually unable to find even a single mutation in MUR A that provides resistance against phosphomycin, really highlighting what a good target MUR A is for further development. I'm sure you've noticed by now that apart from this MUR A story, we have two different anti-LPXC compounds that we tested, and one of them is clearly better than the other. The PF compound at all concentrations tested outperforms the other one. Um, so apart from prioritizing good targets for antibiotic development, we also have a way of, of uh, prioritizing lead compounds for further uh, focusing of your efforts. Now. Um, here, all the data represented are all of the different amino acid substitutions that can cause resistance. 
However, it's very important to note that not all of them are equally likely to occur in vivo. Amino acid substitutions that require two SNPs or even three SNPs will almost never occur in clinical practice. So we split up all of the resistance mutations that we found into the minimal number of SNPs that is needed to get to this amino acid substitution. And then you see that all our conclusions hold up, even if we look at only the one SNP changes. MIR A is clearly the superior antibiotic target from a resistance development point of view, uh, while uh, across the LPXC compounds that we tested, the PF1 shows more potential. And so taken together, I do believe that we can use this deep mutational scanning approach to help guide antibiotic development. So we did this with a high throughput CRISPR genome editing approach, which I think is critical here so that we can study the effect of these mutations in their actual genomic context, which is also what will happen in clinical practice. Um, we use these data to also look at molecular mechanisms that underlie the catalytic uh, uh, function of all of these proteins. But we can also say that based on our limited pilot study, your A is a superior antibiotic target to focus on, and if you want to uh, develop anti-LPXC compounds, then let's start from the PF1. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zola. That's a really good job. Uh, any questions? Yeah. So a couple of questions. One is your uh, selection was in axionic culture. So is that the right place to be selecting? Because that will not be the you know, in vivo situation under which yes. things will occur. Yes, um, definitely there will be differences. Um, we, we actually know, so the mutations we find here that provide resistance against phosphomycin, we know, for example, that these mutations can only occur in vitro because in vivo they decrease the virulence a lot and they cannot occur. So clearly already we see a difference and we expect many more differences to be there. Um, of course, the problem is that we cannot find this perfect uh, situation to test them. Uh, we can of course get closer to the actual clinical situation by looking at intracellular infection models or, or whatever. Uh, so indeed this could be very much an improvement, a uh, nice next step. But as a proof of concept, uh, we believe this was, this was enough. And also, you know, there are many essential genes, but actually in clinical practice, there are very, very few drug targets. So uh, why, why is that? Yes, so for essential genes, um, the reason why we picked these ones is because they are very specific to bacteria. Uh, many other essential genes in bacteria are also essential in humans, which makes them hard to target specifically. So this is one of the things to take in, into consideration when developing them and choosing your target. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, I had a related question on that. Um, just trying to get an understanding of how uh, on target the resistance is for these antimicrobials. Like, what percentage of clinical resistance is in one of these targets, in the drug target? Yes, so this is definitely not the case for all of them. There are uh, targets, uh, antibiotics, like for quinolone, cyprofloxacin, ofloxacin, and so on, that uh, where resistance clinically indeed occurs through target modification. But this is not the case for all of them. Some uh, antibiotic resistance mechanisms function by limiting the excess of the antibiotic into the cell or increasing the export out of the cell. So uh, in this case, um, our approach will not help, definitely. So uh, I do not say this is the only thing you have to check, but it can help in, in some cases, yes. Maybe we can take one more question from there. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you. <laughs> Um, hi, lovely talk, thank you. I was wondering if you thought about going back to your non-viable mutations uh, to see if they could be potential novel uh, targets, target residues, um, to create 
um, novel compounds? Yes, I think this is super interesting and indeed this is also one of the reasons why we overlaid this tolerance score on top of the protein structure because anything that sticks out, even if it's not the catalytic site, might be interesting to target with a small compound. Unfortunately for the ones that we chose, we do not find any other important regions on the surface of the protein apart from the substrate binding site. But indeed, I think it's very much a possibility for other, comp uh, other targets that are still out there that we might find a site that is important, but not at the catalytic region. Yeah. Okay, we got one question online. Is that, is that actually my own question? But okay. Sorry, taking a yeah. liberty. Um, yeah, great talk. I, I was wondering if you <coughs> took into consideration the uh, mutational signatures in E. coli and other bacteria to see the likelihood of the different mutations arising. You, you show, you know, one SNP, but is one SNP more likely to occur in that protein and cause resistance than another because CTC mutations might be more common or something like that? I must say that I did not consider this and so we did not take a look, um, but yeah, could be nice. Okay, well, thanks. Okay, we have time for one more question. Yeah, thank you. Very interesting um, talk. I was wondering how general these mutation patterns might be. If you look at other bacteria, obviously, if you have an antibiotic, you want to hit multiple bacteria at the same time, at least whatever, most gram-negative bacteria or so. So do you think that you need to do these screens for many different bacteria, or do you think that the results that you will get are generalizable and, and could be used for many different yeah. bacteria strains? Uh, so this, of course, will depend on the conservation of your target. If the target is highly conserved, then I think he, with one strain investigated, you can hit many, uh, many others as well. But I do want to address, like nowadays, we want to start focusing more on very specific antibiotics rather than broad spectrum. Uh, there's an increasing acknowledgement of the important role bacteria actually play in your body, for example, in your gut. And so we really want to move forward in developing antibiotics that specifically target the bacterium that is currently infecting you and leaving the others alone. So it would actually be very interesting to also find stuff that is very specific to the bacterium you're working with. All right, with that, thank you once again. Thank you.